OK, right, let's begin um, before before we get into the uh, CAD business. Um, what I wanted to do is uh, to bring your attention to the uh, to this um, live stream chat. There's going to be a Google Forms link up there, so that's feedback for the previous session. Um, if you could be so kind and and fill that out, it's literally like five multiple choice uh, questions, maybe some comments that you want to throw in. So at any point you decide to do that, uh, that'll be really helpful. That way we can maintain quality and uh, improve future sessions in this respect. Um, so that's uh, the first order of business. Uh, second, um, Ben, if you can, if you can again post the link for the Brez WhatsApp group chat into this one, please. That'll be that'll be helpful because I've had a couple of people ask um, asked to join the WhatsApp uh, for Brez. All right, fantastic. Um, now, there were a couple of things last session that I brought up. Um, first one being the laser, um, that that um, app that you had for the uh, laser for DXF, okay? So I just wanted to quickly demonstrate how it works because I know it didn't get around to last time. They changed some things in the functions um, and I wasn't aware of it. So just to fill that little knowledge gap, if we, if you ever want to use that laser for DXF um, plugin, uh, once you've downloaded it, uh, you can go straight down to here, save DXF for laser cutting, and it's actually really easy. You just click on that. It says it asks for which face you want to um, you want to laser cut. So we're going to pick this um, this lightning webbed uh, side of uh, of the ejection seat. Um, yeah, we just select that. Um, keep that laser curve. In fact, so you can ask Kevin Robinson in Tower C what the laser curve is, but uh, you know this is this is standard. Um, hit OK, and what? And then it'll come up with a um, uh, with your your file browser. You know, so you can select a directory to which you want to save it. Also, what it's going to do, even if I just hit cancel and doesn't save it, it still saves the path over here at the bottom, almost like a separate component, uh, or literally like a separate component that you can use later on. So that's very, very helpful. You can actually save that as a separate file, um, as I've shown uh, last time within Fusion. So you can um, uh, you can access that later, okay? So really, really neat plugin, uh, works better than the built-in DXF functionality within Fusion, uh, and because uh, we're going to be focusing a lot. A lot of the focus is going to be on multi-material assembly, so that might involve uh, stuff like uh, 3D printing certain components, and then maybe laser cutting certain components. Because it's it's quite silly to print just a flat sheet, right? When you can uh, when you can just cut it out, uh, that becomes uh, more and more uh, helpful. Okay, so that's uh, that's the first um, order of business. Now, as we're as we're going to be working with um, optimizing things for 3D printing, uh, I had a thought uh, last session. I brought up, um, uh, you know, one of the first things I brought up was how do you take uh, a certain component and chop it up uh, properly for 3D printing? Now, so so we're going to be thinking more about manufacturing today um, and some considerations. So. You know, based on that thought, just before this meeting, I managed to uh, bash together this little um, ejection seat bucket. You know, so for those of you who aren't familiar with um, with what I'm on about, it's one of these things, right? It basically, in the event of uh, of an unrecoverable aircraft, it basically just yeets the uh, pilot out and to safety. So this is, yeah, you know, one of these things. And uh, what came to mind is that. Um, that was a guy on Instagram. He was 3D printing like this gigantic model of a tornado, and uh, he decided to print the entire seat in one go. Okay, in one go. Now, for those of you who um, aren't familiar with how 3D printers work, you know they just go layer by layer by layer by layer. So there are some things that where the filament's going to be um, in line with a plane, which is helpful, and some things which uh, aren't. And I'll demonstrate exactly what I mean uh, in a moment. So. <clears throat> Well, I'm, I'm just a question to the to the group here. What's the first thing that you notice about about this ejection seat, uh, or at least the bucket? 
OK, structurally, what's the first thing that you notice? And feel free to just shout it out. There's two parts. Uh, yeah, yeah, there are two parts. OK, and uh, say if we um, if we just deactivate that, we, we just take a look at this one for now. Yeah, so what's unique about this? It's all straight lines. Well, except for the curves in uh, the most of it is straight lines, I guess. Yeah, Daniel, you'd be you'd be absolutely right. Um, so what we can see, if we actually look from the top, you see that there's two major, you know, boards over here, two major boards over here, and then you've got a bunch of um, of these straight edges. Now, there would be scenarios in which you could say, oh yeah, we can, you know, laser cut all of this, but let's just uh, look at it from the standpoint of 3D printing. Um, obviously, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be beneficial for a number of reasons to 3D print this in one entire go and um, the first reason being 3D printers, they are reliable, but for the uh, for the most part, they aren't completely reliable. So prints do fail, you know, part way through. Last thing you want to do is actually put this entire geometry, this entire model on, and then it fails about halfway somewhere and you have to start again. It's a big waste of time. Uh, secondly, um, something that's really, really important is, um, is the orientation of the filaments. Now, from a structural standpoint, I'm sure, you know, it might look very, very cool that you have all this like sci-fi looking industrial webbing on, okay? But it's got a very, very good uh, reason for that. Um, this is area where the the seat has actually been thickened to take most of the pilot's weight and the stresses through ejection, right? And then the rest has been lightened because you don't have uh, that many stress forces acting through it. So, you know, why make it all thick and heavy? Um, when when that material is redundant, so it's been thinned out, and that way you get these uh, webs. This is actually um, almost like a Newtonian, you know, uh, pencil and paper approach to um, what we have uh, generative design and topology optimization for today. So I don't know if any of you have seen um, seen stuff like uh, like this uh, generative design. Yeah, so structures like or organic looking structures that have been designed around stress points by the computer. Well, you can see, you know, it's a very, very similar structure. So that's kind of the rationale behind it. Um, so when 3D printing, you also need to think about which direction the filaments are the strongest in. OK, so <clears throat> I'm going to walk through the process of how to get from fusion uh, straight to um, straight to Cura. All right. Uh, there, there's tutorials on Cura on how to actually set up the bed. It's uh, and for for each specific printer. So depending on what might you might be using, um, there's going to be a separate tutorial on that. But I'll, I'm going to walk you through exactly how to place it and how to do it in the most efficient manner. So first of all, um, you can Ed, probably notice. Yeah. You know that parts that you wouldn't 3D print would also yeah. be in different pieces that would join together. Because yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. So this entire thing would be divvied up into uh, multiple components. You're absolutely right. Uh, how to join those? I will explain um, after uh, after I show you how to um, how to break it up into components. But uh, again, you know, there, there could be um, there could be a number of different ways that you can join this together, and I'll show that in a moment. Uh, it's just right now, it's a matter of uh, breaking it up into parts that are strong and efficient to uh, put together. But I'll get around to uh, uh, to joining them up um, in uh, in a minute. Okay. So okay, so we can you know we, we can grab this entire bit and we've got um, we've got this split body function here, so we can select that as a splitting. So this surface, right? We want it to be flat, and then this surface. Okay. Hit okay, and we've got three different um, you know three different uh, components here. Right. OK, sweet. So let's just go ahead and export that. Um, so it will be save as STL. OK. Good downloads. Um, and we'll go with uh, right panel. STL. Left panel. And then 
backrest, yeah? Okay, so we've saved uh, three of those folders, and we're going to go into Cura here. Uh, this is the, the, this is what the software is going to uh, open up to. Um, we can open here, downloads, grab all three, and then port them. Now, obviously, I've, this was slightly a uh, life-size uh, model, so we're going to just scale these down. Okay, just uh, pretend that, you've <laughs> that you're uh, that you're building a model of this guy. Okay, so scale this down. Let's go to 10%. Yeah, 10%, that'll be fine. And then you can translate that just using the uh, arrows here. Okay, for some reason, it only imported one of the um, one of the panels, so we're going to do the right panel here as well. I'll just place that inside. Okay, cool. So that's in there, and then let's get the uh, left panel in. Now, there is an auto-arrange function where you can say, oh, arrange all models, and uh, that'll just position it. But what I want to do is uh, bring your attention to how to position it in a custom manner. Now, OK, imagine, um, imagine you decided to you know, just straight up import the components. And there's a couple of things that are going to that's going to happen. So if we were to print this entire seat bucket in one go, uh, what's going to happen is you've got these overhangs, right? And they're going to generate supports. Now, supports are an absolute pain to clean up, and even and sometimes uh, the surface around it is not um, it's not the cleanest in that respect, right? So, one also maybe avoids um, places where you have overhangs because that might um, it might pose um, risk areas where the print might fail, you know, for 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 various reasons. Uh, so to mitigate that, um, what's the first thing? Uh, what's the first thing that you can do? Well, the first thing that you can do, actually, let me let me, let me, let me slice this up. You can get a better printer. <laughs> yeah, you can get a better printer. Um, honestly, one of the best printers that you can get is actually a hundred uh, under two hundred pounds. It's the Ender Three, and that will do like ninety percent of everything that um, uh, that you need. And uh, I think uh, there's people in this chat, Ali, Rob, Ben, who can back me up on this. We had an eight hundred pound Prusa, and we had a two hundred pound uh, Ender Five, and I think the Ender Five is pretty much the Kalashnikov of three uh, D printers. Like it'll it'll chew through anything. Um, or as the Prusas, they're they're really they're good. They're very good when they're in good nick. The moment there's a little bit of dust on them or something, they go a bit funny. So uh, we we had a good year and a half of printing, uh, so we know we've gone through the pain of that. Okay, mm. so now we want to preview this. So this is sliced up. If I bring this in a little bit closer, this you, you can see there's every single layer over here, right? Every single layer. Um, let's go to color scheme. Okay, so material color, shell, and then the extruder itself. Right, so usually when you're printing, um, it's not going to do it with overhang, so you need you need uh, support material, okay? And right now, already without support material, this is going to take six hours, okay? This is going to take six, six hours, layer by layer. And uh, obviously, there's pauses between layers where the extruder needs to move up, uh, let the layer cool. You know, there's a number of um, uh, there's a number of uh, settings you need to go through. So it's not a continuous uh, it's not a continuous process. Firstly, secondly, imagine if this was like a life size seat, right? Now, if I can bring your attention to the bottom corner of the seat, what do you see? Well, you've got a layer, you know, the, the, the bottom section layer finishing here and the next one here. So literally the backrest is holding on this tiny, you know, 10 millimeter line. So the moment you put any stress on that, 
it's going to snap and it's going to snap right about there. So first, so off the bat, you can see that this is um, uh, this is a bad orientation. And imagine if, if we even uh, generate supports, OK, and we slice that up. So we go from from inefficient placement and uh, and six hours to up to seven hours and 50 if we actually uh, put the supports in. Uh, let's see if we can get the um, get the support view. OK, so <clears throat> how do we mitigate that? Well, first of all, we change the orientation. So one way that you can do it is turn this on its side, right? So you want to rotate it 90 degrees until it's lying flat. Same thing on there. And then same thing for the seat. OK, and actually we'll uh, We'll improve the placement of this. We'll just get them out of the way there. Sorry, Ed, can I just say, if you click on the rightmost option on the orientation menu, you can pick a side to align so you don't yeah. have to rotate it yourself. Yeah, yeah, that's that's absolutely right. Um, there is that. So one, there's also another consideration is if you want to speed up the print, you wouldn't want the head moving around too much. So you can actually optimize it and put the parts closer together as well. So just to reduce the amount of empty travel time so uh, that the uh, extruder does. So it doesn't run, um, it doesn't run, uh, you know, the, the print over here and then it has to travel halfway across the bed to there. Uh, so that's another consideration, especially if you're uh, printing uh, a number of parts. So you put them a little bit closer like this. Uh, that should reduce some time there as well. Oh, this the other way. OK, so let's slice this up. Fantastic. So we're down to we're down to six hours, but six hours again. But the most interesting bit is if we take a look over here. Yeah, this entire seat bucket that we can see starting from from start all the way to the to the finish. Actually, if we so you can see it layer by layer and um, just to demonstrate this even more, you can see where the um, where the extruder will travel as well. Right. I don't know if if you can see the the shaded uh, edge, but you can see where the um, what's going to happen to every single layer in the G code. You know, you move it to layer number two, um, and you can see that the head moves. You know, for, from one end all the way to the other. So the entire seat's made up of a single filament. That's going to be much stronger than just the backrest held on by you know, like a like a two millimeter, you know, sized um, sized adhesion area over there. Okay, so that pretty much, uh, you know, in a nutshell, that's uh, one of the main considerations there is uh, for for three D printing. Um, in terms of manufacturing in general, yeah. So we can see that there's uh, there's the um, uh, support material that gets placed over here to um, to get these uh, portions as well. But generally, um, one of the best pieces of advice uh, will be don't 3D print a box, right? <laughs> if, you, if you can avoid doing that, um, because there's better manufacturing processes for, do, uh, for doing very, very um, simple shapes. But if you're stuck with a 3D printer, um, rather than doing it all in one giant PC, if you can uh, divide it up. Now, to move on to a question of how do you assemble it after, I'm going to do a little example here. Um, there's two ways you can do this. You can either have it slot together. OK, so I can create a. I can create a groove that goes all the way down. Let me, uh, and create a groove that runs all the way down, you know, uh, the sides into which the um, the bucket can fit, and uh, in fact, we can. I can demonstrate that right now. Let's uh, switch off this bit. Yeah. Okay. Demonstrate that here. So if I 
make that go out, say, 10 millimeters. And then on this side, also 10 millimeters. So I'm currently using the offset face um, offset face function. So this is so you don't actually have to extrude anything. You just uh, allow it to uh, extend a bit further out. All right. And we're going to bring these back now. OK, so now you can probably see that um, that this seat buckets actually firmly pressed inside of um, inside of this side panel. OK, so what do we do next? Well, you want to you want to combine it. So we're going to be using this um, this seat bucket as the tool. OK, so we select this as a tool body and we select those side panels as the target bodies. And what we want it to do is to cut through, OK, cut into it. And we want to keep the tools, all right? You don't want them to be consumed after. You can hit OK and uh, let that just compute through. Wicked. So once you remove that, you see that there's a groove in there. OK, running all along the edge all the way to the end. Right. Now, <clears throat> you can probably see there's one little mistake. You you got to watch out for this thing. Um, this is why I should have used extrude instead of the uh, offset face, and uh, I'll explain exactly why. Um, we'll remove that there quickly. When you do offset face, you can see that this bit extends out as well, right? So to avoid that, for it to uh, move directly out, should have used extrude instead. Um, so we'll undo that quickly. Bring that back to uh, where it was, hit minus 10. Then we can extrude that by 10 mil. And then we get exactly that truncated end so it doesn't poke out, uh, poke out the side. And it will just repeat the process. OK, so we want to use that as a target, use that as a tool. Keep that there. And then OK, fantastic. So we're up to speed now. OK. We've managed to create uh, two parts that slot into each other, right? And this is another manufacturing consideration that you need to make. Uh, I said we're going to get around to tolerancing. Now, tolerancing is making sure that uh, even though your dimensions are are good, they're accurate, you want to make the parts fit together. What's tolerancing for? Can everyone tell me? No? OK. So Can you make sure. No, go ahead. Yeah, it's, well, it's the inherent inaccuracies of certain manufacturing processes. So if you um, if you tell them that, OK, um, I need this panel to be 24, say 24.03 millimeters thick, right, for example, um, you might go on the CNC or have a milling machine or whatever does this uh, portion and it'll be 24.03 millimeters. Well, it'll be 24.03 plus minus 0.1 or 0.15, depending on how precise the manufacturing process is, right? Um, so that's one of the considerations, one of the biggest considerations that you need to make when you're when you're 3D printing or manufacturing anything. So, can you tell me? Can anyone tell me what the gap between um, between this panel that I've just taken out? Okay, let's uh, make that. So this panel over here for the backrest I've just taken out in this groove, what's the gap between there and the upper surface? I mean, how thick it is. Yeah, yeah. So, so what's the spacing? What's the spacing right um, now, now that I've just cut it out? It's zero. Is yeah, exactly. It's it's zero. So, you know, it's, it's perfectly flush. And in fact, if I were to uh, measure it, I'll just select this upper surface. 
and then that lower surface right there, bam, zero. OK, um, there's you, you know, there's no spacing. And in fact, if you were to manufacture or 3D print this, this backrest would not slot in at all, no matter how much you tried um, it. Because first of all, there's things like thermal expansion to take into account just the fact that 3D printers are inherently they, they are accurate, but they're not so accurate, right, that they uh, they can just squeeze into an infinitely small gap, right? Um, so how do we combat this? Well, to get around it, there's two ways. Um, if I were to use a sketch to create this, um, this backrest, I can design the sketch in, um, but that's actually tedious and uh, sketches, they're uh, how, how would I say they're more prone to human error in the sense that if I wanted to make um, this entire area or the thickness between this plate and this plate smaller, right? Uh, if I wanted to make a point once more, I'd have to go around and redo the entire sketch. There'll be things shifting. Uh, there's easier ways to do this, and I'm about to show you. So. My approach would be design everything with infinitely small spacing, with zero spacing, OK? Because that's the easiest. Uh, use the, um, the, the the design sizing to do that. And then when you need to sort out your tolerancing, well, it's quite simple. Let's, uh, let's go to that uh, offset face tool. And you know that we need a 0.1 millimeter gap all the way around, right? So the overall, um, the overall clearance will be 0.2 of a millimeter top and bottom. OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to select these faces. I go all the way around this bucket. Oh, maybe that bit was a bit complex. OK. You know what? You get the idea. You usually go around uh, the entire thing. In fact, so I'll just select this top bit as well. Wouldn't it make more sense to offset the groove that's inside the panels? Yeah, you're absolutely right. You can make uh, so you could go either way. You can either make this back panel uh, thinner or you can make the inside uh, larger. So uh, that's a good that's a good call. Um, uh, we can we can do that instead. I'll just demonstrate that to you now. Uh, okay, where's it gone? Now remember that the actual um, that the actual tolerancing that goes for depth as well, right? So I want to get the um, the surface inside here. Remember, the 3D printer it prints in uh, something like uh, 0.2 or 0.15 millimeter layers. Okay, so where it decides to end a uh, certain measurement for you might be a little bit different, and you need to take that into account. Yeah, cool. So we've gotten that groove sorted out, and now we just need to make it a tiny bit larger. So let's go with minus 0.1. Nice. So now that we've placed that inside, I don't know if it's uh, visible, but there's a tiny gap just over there in that corner that you can see. But if I were to switch on the wireframe, you can see there's a gap there, right? Um, and that would uh, that that would sort out all of your clearance issues. Now, a second thing to take into account is. Um, if you want to get into a corner, now corners get really, really funny with um, uh, with fitment. Another thing that you can do is create chamfers, right? Fillets or chamfers. So fillet is a rounded corner, so you can go one millimeter on that, and that's going to help with your uh, with your corner clearance. Or I can pick the bottom one out and uh, use a chamfer, and the chamfer will actually just slice the corner off uh, like so. Okay. And uh, here this is equal distance, but you can pick two distances or an angle depending on what sort of information you're provided with. Right. 
So that's uh, that's another thing that you can do. OK. Now, lastly, um, now that we've created a groove, uh, depending on you know what the size of uh, of the seat is, if you're building a model of some kind uh, just to slap on your desk or put on your shelf, then you'd probably use glue or something and fit the two together, right? If you're building something a bit more robust, chances are you're probably going to be using screws or bolts to put it together. Now, um, what you might have seen some people do is actually put the screw directly into the plastic, uh, through the plastic, um, in some kind of really, really dodgy manner that uh, you, you know you, you really don't understand how that how that's going to hold up. Um, I'm here to show you a slightly better way of doing it, and the best way to do it with uh, PLA is uh, thread inserts. So these guys right here, you can buy them. I think a hundred for a pound off eBay, you know. Um, but these are a worthwhile investment. Uh, and usually you'd probably use them with an M3 bolt. M3 bolts, you can just pick up from the design department. Um, don't tell them I said that. So this stuff um, will be like the most professional way and the cleanest way that you can uh, put together a set of components. I'm showing sure it on this bucket seat, but you can apply this principle all the way throughout. Now, how do you get the threaded inserts inside of um, inside of this plastic? Well. Let's take a look at this. Um, you've got this thread insert. It's made of metal, right? Um, cool. And if anyone's has anyone done soldering before? Yeah, soldering. Yeah. OK, for those who um, uh, who haven't, <coughs> um, what I'm going to do is. Uh, uh, bring up one of these. So soldering iron, basically it melts, um, you know, lead, not not lead, but um, a type of metal that allows you to to weld contacts together. Yeah, uh, soldering uh, PCB. Yeah, this this is what it does, and this tip heats up to something like two hundred degrees, right? Uh, maybe even more than that. So the idea behind it is that you'd put that threaded insert on top of it, and because it's uh, you use a heat uh, convection through the metal, what's going to happen? is that you can melt this guy into the plastic or into a hole that you've prepared for it. And uh, let me demonstrate exactly what I mean by that. So if we, if we wanted to uh, create a hole for a bolt on this size, on this side right here, yeah. Uh, let's just create a sketch on the surface. Uh, now, because the threaded insert is going to be for a um, let's say a six millimeter bolt, right? Um, that means that the diameter should probably be larger, probably about seven. Let's go with uh, 7.6, okay? Uh, normally you'd go and find a data sheet for this, but th uh, this is only for a demonstration, right? So you would uh, create a hole that's uh, 7.6 millimeters in diameter. I remember, um, make sure you uh, constrain that. Let's go with uh, 12 and 12, right? So we've selected this position for it. Great. So close that. Now we know that we need some clearance for the bolt to go inside. So we're going to cut into uh, this material. Let's go minus uh, 15, right? So wherever you want to put a threaded insert or wherever you want to put a bolt, always prep a hole for that. And the reason why, why I stress getting threaded inserts is because the plastic, especially if we print layer by layer going out uh, this way, um, the plastic is not going to hold more than once. You put that bolt in, don't ever take it out because you're going to fray the plastic. And after a couple of uh, times that you've taken the bolt in and out, um, you would have stripped all of the internals for that. So always use threaded inserts. Uh, now, what we can do is we place um, now we need to create uh, a way to attach the bolts uh, through this side. Well, th this would be fairly simple. Uh, what you do is I'm going to just select that profile through there. We'll select this one, bring that panel back out, and we will cut through it. OK, great. So for a six millimeter, for an M6 bolt, or, which is six millimeters in diameter, that will be fine. But the bolt's going to be sitting outside. so. If I just bring this up here, right? 
Um, the bolt's going to be just sitting on the surface, but maybe you want to go neater than that. Maybe you, you want the bolt head to be completely flush, right? So um, M3 bolts. Let's see what that gives. So when you have screws uh, flush with uh, the surface, right? It gives a much cleaner look. Um, okay, well, Google's not bringing anything up. All right, but in order to do that, what I would recommend, so if you've got 7.6, let's go, let's go to uh, 14 mil, yeah? So for M6 is 14 is usually enough. What we're going to do is we're going to cut in like this. So you create a hole, um, you know, in um, in that sort of shape, right? And what's going to happen is that the bolt will fit perfectly inside, and the bolt head will be flush with the rest of the surface. So if you ever need to place anything in front, uh, it's not going to get in the way, and it looks much neater and uh, and far more professional. Now, I don't know if, uh, how many of you have managed to um, play around with Fusion in the meantime, but um, I'm sure you would have already seen some, uh, some functionality in terms of using, using a mirror plane, so a mirror or a rectangular pattern, just to avoid doing really, really repetitive stuff. Now, I know this is applicable to sketches, but there's a neat little trick where you can actually apply it to features, so physical body features um, on, um, what is it, on the, um, on whatever it is that you're designing, or whatever component you're designing. So if I were to, let's turn off all of the sketches, because we don't need them anymore. Let's select the different objects. So you can select that, insert there, and then select all the features. So you've selected the entire bolt housing, um for that and say you needed to create i don't know maybe uh four of them you know along this line well you do that there and then you can select the direction well we know that the direction's got to be uh somewhere that's parallel to um to the to this backrest so we select that line as um as a reference and now we've got a number of parameters because you can create either a grid of them yeah, but right now we just need a line. So you say, okay, we need four in a certain direction. Okay, so that gives four uh, outs. Actually, we only need just one there, and we need four there. Brilliant. Now you've got two options, the extent. Now the extent will be how far this pattern actually reaches. Okay, so the more I drag it out, the larger that extent is going to be. But say we need spacing, all right? And we need these to be exactly uh 36.6 millimeters apart right okay you can hit okay and there you go and uh I'll just uh, open up the wireframe you can see that's created these uh, bolt holes for you so that's going to stop that's going to um, save you a lot of time and a lot of um uh annoyance in terms of doing highly repetitive tasks now what uh, once you're done uh what you can do is uh is send that to the printer. Once that comes from the printer, you can just put the threaded insert inside. Um, I would recommend, let's go, cube. Oh, thanks. I'll actually show you a neat little trick. So this is, this is what you can do with it. So what he does is he puts the um, threaded insert on the soldering iron. And then because of the heat being convected, it goes in like butter. So this is going to be straight. It'll reinforce the edge. And uh, you can happily place a bolt inside of that. So um, definitely, definitely worth uh, using that sort of approach to it. OK. Um, 
I think that that covers the majority uh, majority for you know 3D printing and just general manufacturing considerations. So in terms of orientation, in terms of how you would slice uh, a particular model up. So normally I'd recommend looking at seam lines, right, uh, to do that. Uh, is there anything else that you might have questions about or uh, want me to cover while we're here? I think I'm just out of the loop this whole thing. So I just want the context of what's actually happening. Because there's talk of soldering but and not um, and nails and nuts, but in the context of what I was talking. Because I, I missed the last few weeks, so... Okay, right. Um, <clears throat> so right now we're talking about how do you take a 3D model, um, slice it up properly for uh, for three D printing, and I think um, we, we've got we've got a recording uh, for this, so you can take a look at it in more detail. But it's how to attach three D printed components together more effectively. Because if you don't put um, if you don't put these threaded inserts, what's going to happen is if you try to put a bolt into the plastic, well, it'll hold for a little bit and then it'll strip out, and you'll never be able to place it in again. Okay. Um, so 3D printing is great, but again, you don't need to print everything on the one giant monolith, print it in parts, and then uh, the, I explained exactly how to uh, combine these parts in the most effective manner that A, looks professional, is accurate, and uh, fits together, and will last, okay? So uh, if, if you want to get a more detailed explanation of that, I recommend then uh, having a look at the recording, but that's the gist of it. Cool. Yeah. Um, if you do want to see the recording of the last session where Ed covered um, actually how to do 3D printing and modeling, and uh, sorry, 3D modeling and covering all of this, that will be on our YouTube channel soon. We're just mm -hmm. uh, figuring it all out. Yeah. Uh, one last uh, one last uh, note. Uh, does anyone know actually what um, usually one of the standard export files for CAD uh, for CAD uh, models? is uh, STEP or IGES, okay? So uh, if I just bring this up. Um, it'll be, uh, let's see. Should make that font a little bit larger. So it's going to be STEP or IGES. Now, so when I said that we use STL, STL is kind of like the, the dumb file. So all it does is it outputs this kind of mesh um and you're not able to do anything so it's it's a complete empty shell uh, so it's only good for 3d printing but if you ever decide for example you want to use assets offline uh download existing 3d models always go for step or iges uh, because these things they contain all of the computational information within a component so all of the xyz axes um you know you can actually upload it and then directly start interacting it using functions like combine split body it'll detect all of the um, fillets that you've um, uh, that you've placed so these features it's called feature detection uh, you might come across that if you decide to work with these files um, or chamfers you know all these types of things um, which is you know it's, it's quite useful because when I started out I thought oh well you know solid works I know I know uh, something like uh, SLD PRT right you're going to see quite a lot of that no the best ones the most um, widely used are step and IGES so that's one thing to, to look out for you'll never be able to work with STL inside of a CAD environment so STL is almost like a uh, like a baked version of it that's completely solidified and you you know you, you can't work with that so always look out for these uh, worst case scenario you might be able to do something with this which comes from SolidWorks okay so that's just another tip because um, chances are right you don't need to you don't need to cut up everything um, from the beginning especially if you can download it an existing model uh, offline right it'll save you a lot of time yeah. Okay. So that's it from me. Uh, if you've got any questions, uh, feel free to shout uh, shout them out. Um, but before before I head off, um, I know we said that we want to do a roast my CAD design, roast my CAD work on um, on Wednesday the twenty eighth. So this is going to be for an iPhone holder. Um, I'm sure Ben's already linked everyone in with the um, with the Instagram posts. Uh, no. Okay. Uh, well, let's get those links in. But basically, the idea is to create 
an iPhone holder uh, in CAD. So, yeah, so something like this. Um, let's go something similar. All right, something like this, for example, um, or something like this. Bonus points go for creativity, uh, the use of functional multi-components. So if you've got several parts that snap together and they they are tolerant to well and everything. Um, yeah. And how do you submit? Well, to submit, what I'd recommend is send us your emails. OK, and what we're going to do is we're going to add you to uh, to the CAD sesh one uh, folder. OK, so right here I've got um, I've got the people I've, so far. I've got two people who uh, who want to submit. Basically, just drag and drop that design. You're going to have exactly the same folder show up in your uh, in your projects directory. Just drag and drop your design into there, and I'll be able to see who it's from and uh, and what it's for. And then uh, on the 28th, we're going to open this up and uh, and have a run through that. Okay, does that sound good? Yep. Yeah. All right, so just make sure you uh, you send us in uh, your email on the chat here. Yeah, I've got. Fantastic. Uh, I'm going to just add you in there. All right, fantastic. You're invited now, um, and you'll have the directory pop up uh, exactly like this. So just drag and drop, and that's what we'll use for uh, for the submissions. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Have you got any? Before you leave, I don't know. Yeah. What's up? Um, how did you how did you change the mesh sizing on an STL file on Fusion 360? Uh, for an STL file, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly for an STL file, but for example, if you've got the entire um, if you've got an entire model loaded up, what I would do is it actually works quite quite easily. OK, let me demonstrate. So you've got you've got your bucket seat, right? And I'll actually put everything in there. So say you want to scale everything like usually you can go selectively uh, which bodies you want to scale. But if you want to scale everything, uh, select all of these guys and then go to modify and scale. OK, now here you have the entity selected. Uh, you should have four entities selected and point, you know, deselect because it's going to choose something at random. So if we want to scale against this corner, what we're going to do is we're going to select that corner and then it'll change the scale factor, right? But what's uh, going to happen? Oh, yeah, so do that uniformly. Um, things when I know in Korea, when you export a part as an STL file to 3D print, you yeah. can change the mesh sizing, so how fine or how coarse the mesh is. Oh, right, part. yeah. So yeah. then how you do it in Fusion. Sure, so if you if you um, select one of these, uh, let's go with that one, yeah. If you select one of these, save as STL, and it says refinement here. So this is, uh, this is the tessellation and all of the uh, parameters, uh -huh. but yeah. So you, so you can preview the mesh and, and there you go. That's uh, that's what it would spit out in terms of uh, STL. So if you want to go to uh, low, that's what the tessellation there would be. And then you can set your custom refinement. OK. Yeah. Um, and uh, over here, yeah, there's some of these parameters. But honestly, I've I've just set it to high and never had a problem with it as far as Fusion is concerned. Generally, just leave it alone. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> So I think on mine it's stuck as low. So oh, okay. I okay, get yeah. a lot of triangles on my three D print from Fusion. Gotcha. Well, this is uh, this is where you would uh, you would normally change it. You can set that to high um, off here, and that should, that should be alright. Um, Ed, just before you finish, have you? Because I missed the beginning bit, so I'm I'm sorry about that. Um, did you take them through taking that to an FDL into Cure and all the slicing process? Yeah, yeah. So so we've gone through that. We've gone oh. through. Uh, through all of the orientation um, orientation stuff and how to optimize it for strength. Let's put it that way by taking into account the filament direction. And Fantastic. Stuff. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think other than that, um, cheers, Ed. If anyone's got questions, obviously yeah. ask now. Um, we did post a Google Forms link at the beginning. I'm going to 
share that again. If people could please just take the time to fill out uh, a Google Forms, it's basically just a kind of survey on how you found these two sessions so that we can make sure that things are constantly improving. Um, that would be very much appreciated. Mm -hmm. Sure, and I've got all the, all your emails in, so I'll add those in once um, at the end of the session. Yeah. Perfect. Cool. Any questions, Fred? If I have questions, you probably asked them already. <laughs> uh, you can go back and watch oh. these sessions once we've uploaded them as well. Yeah. Yeah, right. so uh, again, yeah, one last note is um, on, the, on the 28th or for the 28th, just upload uh, the design along with all of the sketches, just your exact design file, because then I'll be able to take a look through your sketches, see what you're doing, uh, what's good, what needs improvement, um, and that'll save you time in terms of learning, right? If I just straight up tell you what, uh, <laughs> what you're doing wrong, it doesn't have to propagate out through, um, through the work that you do in the future. Oh, okay. yeah. Quick question, uh, yeah. this software you're using, can yeah. it be used on, on a low fidelity laptop? <laughs> oh yes. Without, without <laughs> yes. you know, without my laptop sounding like a wind turbine. Wait, just to give you an idea, this runs on like a dual core i5 seventh gen processor. Okay. You can so. run it on your phone probably. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so if you bought something in the last hazard. year. If um, you I still want a fire else. hazard in my house, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The, if the uni la uh, if the uni computers can run it, then your laptop will be yeah. just fine. Oh no, it's just a HP Pavilion from 2010, so I'm not sure about that. It'll be it'll be fine. It'll, it'll be okay. Pre okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, so this uh, I'll give in the group chat. I'll ask you about the actual app name, but yeah. But thanks so for the session. It's called yeah, no worries. It's called um, Fusion 360, uh, and and you can get a free copy off off their website, especially if you use the um, uni email. I'm sure that wouldn't even be. A problem, use your but... uni email for sure. Yeah, you have yeah, to use your uni email, otherwise. They yeah. Run you yeah. One. I mean, I think they're. Je I think it's free for personal use anyway, but yeah. it's, it's worth. It is, the... but they're downgrading the personal one if you're not a if you've got like a commercial. Sorry, not a commercial, a personal license. There's a lot of. I sent a link in the chat. If you click on that, sign in with your Bruno stuff. There's a long list of all the bits of like software you can steal as students. Anything from like AutoCAD, yeah, to AutoCAD, Solid yeah, well. yeah. SolidWorks, yeah. MATLAB, MATLAB all and all that. Yeah, it's all yeah, in yeah, that. If list, I can uh, get a Spotify discount, I should. Oh. Be able to get this <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure you consider Spotify educational. Yeah, yeah. Mm. You know. yeah um, sorry. Yeah, IMO, IMO. How do I pronounce it? Emo? Oh, no, no, no. Basically, most people call Yeah, I'd rather you say Abbasi instead. Abbasi, I just all right. Put, I just put, I just, yeah. I all right, um, Abbasi. Um, so just so your fire hazard doesn't completely get out of hand, um, when you get the software, go in the top right where your, you know, your initials are. You have your Autodesk account profile, and then you go into preferences, okay? So hit your preferences, and make sure you go to design so you get general api and then design and select do not capture design history okay because that eats up ram and that's really gonna that's gonna fry your processor um, yeah. yeah no yeah. trust me um and it, it lags the software and everything honestly you don't need it and speaking of which okay speaking of which why i also suggest to not um uh, to not capture the design history remember when we were looking at the components Okay, uh, components from last session. I'll just uh, open it up. Um, yeah, all of this is in the last session. If you want to go yeah. review it, we will. We'll have yeah, it. there's there's just a there's just a second note. So you had uh, a couple of components over here. Now imagine you wanted to go out and delete this file, right? What would happen is it wouldn't allow you to delete the assembly file first of all until you break the link between these two. Okay, between. Um, your assembly and the component files. And uh, another disadvantage is if you have design history and you actually did break the link, um, it wouldn't allow you to delete the file because the reference exists in the past um, throughout this file. Okay, so because it's captured in a history somewhere. And uh, I spent about two hours trying to figure out why that is. So again, take my word for it. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't design the capture history. Yeah, turn it off, uh, because then it's pretty straightforward. You say, "Oh, I can't design. Uh, I can't delete the assembly because it's got parts reference." Fine, D break the link or uh, between these two. So, 
here, break link, yeah, and then you can get rid of the assembly file should you ever need to clean up your, uh, your directory in your folder. It's just a little um, uh, user interface tip. Cool. All right. Cool. Yeah. All right. Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much, guys, and uh, see you on the 28th. All right. Bye. See you later, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Right. Take care. All right. Bye. Thanks.